Hi, welcome to Roy's Book Reviews. Today I am going to share my thoughts with you about the novel A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolles. A Gentleman in Moscow has been on my uh, radar for quite some time, even though it's not an especially old book. Um, it came out in 2016. Um, but between then and now, it seemed that um, practically every time I would go on a book website like Goodreads or one of the Facebook pages I follow where people talk about books, um, someone had recently um, read and loved this book or read and hated this book because uh, not enough happens in it. Um, I'm always intrigued by books that people either love or loathe or very few falling in the middle. So I finally got around to borrowing a copy from my local library to discover which camp I would fall into. The title provides a healthy portion of plot summary. Amor Toll's book is not about a spy. It isn't about a war hero. It isn't a coming-of-age story or a love story or a revenge story. It isn't about someone who comes to see the error of his ways or who comes to an epiphany after a transformative event. This book is literally about a guy in Moscow. And even that can be said to be too broad a description. Um, since he doesn't spend time in very many neighborhoods or locations throughout the city of Moscow. What Alexander Rostov happens to be is a gentleman in a fancy old hotel named the Metropole, where he spends decades of his life under house arrest. His crime is a poem um, that is credited to him. Uh, being that it's Russia in 1922, a poem which can be translated as a call to action, a call to revolt, um, is sufficient cause for severe punishment. Um, the fact that he's well-connected is why the Count ends up on house arrest rather than being executed. The revolution always seems to be a spark away in Russia, a fact that I was reminded of when a flare-up took place there um, during the time that I was reading this book. I read the majority of it um, over the course of a week while I was on vacation in Long Beach Island in New Jersey. Um, it looked for a minute like Putin was about to be bounced, but he's a resilient guy, as is the country of Ukraine that refuses to be taken over by Russian forces. I suppose it'll be while I'm reading some other book in the future that Putin's reign finally ends one way or another. Revolutions are a pretty big deal to those who are out on the streets, picking sides, waiting to see how it will turn out and what the repercussions of the result will be. But for a man residing in a hotel who rarely sets foot outside of its walls, um, revolution is background noise. A Gentleman in Moscow is about quiet observations of the poetry of the human condition set within narrow physical confines. At the beginning of the story, which has a surprisingly large um, page count for a book about a guy who doesn't go anywhere and do all that much, Rostov is booted from a luxury suite and relocated to a much smaller room in the hotel's attic, his small world rendered even smaller. Uh, without registering complaints, he decides on which possessions will make the trip with him, since he won't have um, enough room to keep everything that he owns. Uh, with quiet dignity and aristocratic bearing, he goes about the business of living for days, weeks, months, years, while the world outside goes on without his participation. He befriends a young girl who is mature beyond her years that is staying with her family in the hotel for an extended period of time. This takes place shortly after Rostov gets his face shaved clean for the first time in you know, however long it's been. 
um, and this fact happens to initiate uh, their first conversation. The friendship proves pivotal for two reasons. The first is that for some reason this girl has a skeleton key that can open any locked door in the hotel. And shortly before her family leaves, she um, gives this gift, this key, to um, Rostov um, as a gift. Uh, the second reason is that years later, as a married woman with a daughter, Nina returns to the Metropole and leaves her daughter Sophia behind with her childhood friend, Count Rostov, um, while she goes off in search of her husband, who's been sent to Siberia. Nina never returns, and so Count Rostov finds himself in the unexpected role of father. He also lands himself a girlfriend. Eventually he gets a job working as a waiter um, in the hotel. Um, he has a clique of good friends who are also employed uh, at the Metropole. So basically Rostov ends up with the bulk of things that people aspire to acquiring. A partner, family, friends, an occupation that he's well suited for. Uh, he has everything except for freedom. Uh, the primary missing ingredient in his life is mobility. Prior to his sentencing to house arrest, he was a wealthy, well traveled man who was content with his circumstances, um, saddened only by the early death of his sister. After his confinement at the Metropole, he remains the same person with the same demeanor as the world keeps spinning. But the thing is, while the happenings of the world at large do affect us and sometimes fascinate us, uh, the private lives we each lead are what matters most to us. Whether a Democrat or a Republican is in charge, whether economic indicators are up or down, whether it's a time of war or peace, stability or upheaval, we have our inner circles that remain largely untouched by the maelstrom outside our doors. For a stretch of pages, I found myself astounded by how little was happening in this novel in terms of plot development. Yet I happily kept reading because it was such a pleasure to bask in the nothingness in the microscopic examination of the beautiful minutia that surrounds us daily. Whatever can be appreciated is a treasure. It might be a fresh shave, or a quality meal, or a melodic tune, or a pleasant conversation. Our ability to appreciate it is what makes a kingdom of our immediate surroundings. Whether that kingdom is a humble room, a luxury suite, a stately palace, or the opportunity to reside in a wide variety of locations throughout the globe. We aren't made rich by how much we acquire, but by how much we value whatever it is that we have on hand and in our hearts. In the end, consider me among those who were enchanted by a gentleman in Moscow. I was reminded of the movie The Terminal. On uh, National Treasure Tom Hanks stars in that one as a guy who is stuck uh, in an airport terminal for weeks because upheaval in his homeland has made him um, temporarily a man without a country. Due to interactions um, with the airport regulars and relationships that he establishes, um, the airport takes on a feeling of home while he's there rather than being like an isolation cell in a prison. It's in another movie, Castaway, where we see Hanks in a true solitary confinement situation. So desperate for companionship that he starts to imagine a volleyball as his friend. Count Rostov is far luckier, in spite of acquired misfortunes, than a guy stranded on a deserted island. Because relationships with our fellow man provide us with infinite currency. Um, this lesson is elegantly displayed in Amor Toll's fine novel. Um, so would I recommend this book to you? I'm not sure because I don't necessarily um, know who you are. 
And so I don't know if reading a book in which not a whole lot happens is something that will appeal to you or something um, that you will find to be an irritant. Um, but if you enjoy uh, beautifully written books, then you certainly will appreciate Amor Toll's prose. I understand that they're making uh, a series out of this book for Showtime, I believe is the channel. I'm not necessarily going to go rushing out to see it because I'm not sure how good of a movie this will end up being since it is such a quiet story, so understated, um, starring Ewan McGregor, I believe. Um, I'm sure eventually I will see it um, just out of curiosity to see how engaging they manage to make it because since not a whole lot happens, it's just really about how compelling you find um, the people that you are watching, um, reading about um, are. And you will either find yourself enchanted and totally charmed by Count Rostov, or you will just wish that you could pick him up and put him into another book where he gets to do some stuff, I suppose. Uh, but in A Gentleman in Moscow, he doesn't get to do a whole much, but yet he does live a, a full life somehow. Um, so that is about all I have to say. But I will add that at the beginning of this review, I mentioned that I saw other people's reviews of this book prior um, to reading it. And by that, I don't mean that I read like entire full length reviews and just skimmed, you know, the top line opinions that people formed the first sentence or two of what they had to say. It was usually something like, I really love this book or I really, why in the world do people like this book? Um, and, but after I read it and wrote my review of it um, for this video, I did then go on Goodreads and read what other people had to say about it, which is something I usually do. I try not to um, influence myself or prejudice myself too much with the opinions of others until I have formed my own opinions about something I've read, preferably while still fresh in mind. And then I will compare and contrast it with what others I've had to say about it, um, see if people agreed with my points, disagreed. Um, a lot of times people point out things that I fail to make mention of, either because I just missed it or it didn't strike me as, you know, a top line thing to want to bring up. But for someone else, you know, that was a, a critical point. Um, and as I was reading the reviews, I found that some of the people who gave it a low review, like one star or zero stars, um, they were defensive or almost apologetic because there were so many other reviews or maybe people they knew who had read this book and loved this book. And I don't know how much book bullying was going on, but there is a tendency when a book is you know, very popular and a lot of people have great things to say about it. Um, you feel compelled to you know, join the herd and say, oh yeah, I, I love it too. I, I see what everyone appreciates in this story. And sometimes you pick up a book like that and you're like, I don't get it. I don't understand what everyone likes about this book. Um, and some people don't feel comfortable being in the minority. Um, they feel kind of strange, so they they might just lie and say they like something they didn't like, or they will hesitantly say they didn't like it, but almost you know in an apologetic way because you know or you know because they feel maybe you know foolish or like what is it? Why can't I get out of this book what others got out out of it? Um, you should not feel that way. Um, that is my word of advice. That has nothing to do with my review. Um, if you loved it, you loved it. If you hated it, you hated it. We all have things that we love about stories and we have things that just don't do a whole lot for us 
we're looking for different types of stories. There are different things that we find compelling or find annoying um, or whatever it is the case may be. So, you know, what's great for me may be horrible for you and vice versa. Um, I try to be as honest as I can be while also, you know, sharing what I appreciated in the book with understanding that someone else might not appreciate um, that aspect. Um, that's just the way it works with books, and that's one of the great things about books that, you know, we each get from it what, you know, our own experience and our own taste um, brings to the table. And I would recommend this book to some people, and I would not re recommend it to others. Um, as for you, Stranger on the Internet, you now know what I thought about it, and you can either decide to run and get a copy, or you can take the copy that you have and throw it into the ocean. Um, whatever floats your boat. Until the next time, this is Roy wishing you happy reading.